Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to look at the musculoskeletal system. So we're going to look at how muscles work and how does the skeleton support the muscles and how they do the movement and all these different things. And we're going to, again, look at some comparative anatomy between uh, vertebrates and invertebrates, the difference between an endoskeleton and an ectoskeleton versus a hydrostatic skeleton, which again is found in typically in worms. And it essentially just means where is the skeleton located? Is it located inside? Is it located on the outside, or is it in, or is it using fluid in the in the um, to kind of contract the muscles and that? And so that's what we're going to look at today. The other thing we're going to look at is how do muscles respond to an action potential? So in the previous chapters, we saw how an action potential is generated, how it moves down the nerve, and in this case, what we're going to look at is what happens in the muscle itself. What what causes the muscle to contract? And how does it work? And so that's what we're going to look at today. And so, uh, again, just how the muscle contracts, how it moves, and then how does it use its skeleton to actually generate the movement that the animal needs to get where it needs to go. And so we'll look at that as well. So, okay. So, again, just looking at the difference between the muscles and the skeleton that's associated with it. We'll talk br very briefly about the joints and that as well. We we'll typically focus in on the muscles and not really look at specific muscles but look at how muscles actually contract and then talk about the difference between an ecto and endoskeleton and hydrostatic and then look at some of the features that allow animals to um, move throughout their environment. So that's kind of what we're going to look at today. So the first thing we're going to look at is how do muscles work and respond to stimuli. The second thing is, is what do muscles need in order to respond? So Again, what causes that signal, the action potential from the nerve, and then the nerve causes a signaling to happen inside the muscle cell, which causes it to contract. So we'll look at that. And then we'll talk about the various skeletal systems and how they do their work. And again, focus in on the endo, the ecto, and the hydrostatic, and look at those things. And then finally, how do the skeletal systems create locomotion in the animal? So we'll talk about the various locomotion. Uh, movement through walking, swimming, and flight looking at some of those different ways and how the skeleton actually does the job that it does. And look at both both vertebrates and invertebrates and, and, and talk about some of the similarities that we see in those situations. So we'll look at that as well. So again, what we're uh, talking about today is animal activity. And so this is just an example of one animal that uses its muscles to not only uh, get food and use that claw to get food. So it has a really tiny claw, which is used for food. And then it has this very large claw, which is not necessarily for grabbing for food, but it could be used for protection. But one of the things that it does is it uses it to uh, kind of uh, get rid of other males. So for competition, we're going to talk about animal behavior in the second part of the lecture in a different lecture uh, in this chapter. And then the other thing that it does is that it allows for an attraction of females. So it's kind of part of their mating behavior. So they wave their claw in the way that they do it. Now, again, a lot of times these animals have bright colors. One of the reasons for the bright colors is to say, stay away, give it as a warning and say, stay away from me. I've got this big claw. Or the other reason why they do it is say, hey, look at my big claw, ladies, and come mate with me because I have good genes. And so that's the other thing that these colors represent. And so we'll get into that with animal behavior in the next lecture. So uh, if you want to talk about animal behavior, look at that lecture next. And again, going through and talking about how animals use their features to attract mates uh, in that case. Now with muscles, muscles always have two muscles, one air and two types of muscles that went, uh, that work and they counteract one another. So typically if we think of like our bicep and we contract our bicep, we always extend our tricep. And the obvious, the other way is when we relax our bicep, we now contract our tricep. And so it's essentially uh, a, a stimulus from the nervous system and we always have an agonist versus antagonist muscle system. So they always have a pair that work together or work in opposite directions of one another. And so it's a process of relaxation uh, where contraction is an active process where you use ATP and the muscle relaxation is passive. And we'll see later on when we start talking about muscles working together, you always have one that's an agonist that gets contracted and one that gets relaxed. And in this case, this one is getting uh, relaxed and then this one is being uh, contracted. So we'll talk about that in those situations in a little while on how we move. Uh, 
Now, in the muscle itself, you have two sets of fibers. You have the thin filaments, which are consisted of two strands of actin coiled around one another. And so the little blue dots here are the actin fi fibers, okay? And they're in a coiled shape. And then you have the thick filaments, which are staggered arrays of myosin. And the myosin kind of has this little claw, which will bind to this troponin, which is on the thin filament. And we're going to talk about how when they grab, and then they do the sliding movement that they slide together to allow for contraction. And we'll see how this all works. But these are going to be the important things. And so we're going to talk about the sliding fiber or the sliding filament model here in a few minutes. But essentially what happens is this claw will reach up and grab this troponin, when it gets activated and then cause the filaments to slide over one atop of the other. And so that's kind of how this contraction works. Now, if we look at the skeletal mu muscle, it's characterized by hierarchy of smaller and smaller units. And so you have the muscle itself, then you have these muscle fibers, which on the inside are wrapped around, and then you have these single um, muscle fi myofibrils on the inside. So you have these fibers, which are kind of these coils and think of them as wires. So each one gets smaller and smaller. And typically you have this very large wire that's kind of uh, uh, composed of these smaller uh, muscle fibers, which is the, 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 uh, the cell itself. And you can see the nuclei that is wrapped around. And on the inside, you have these actin and my myosin uh, fibers, which are the myofibrils. And inside that, you have these different sacromeres. And the sacromeres are these small areas where you have the thin and the thick filaments. And so the thin filaments, again, are the actin, and then the thick filaments are the myosin. The thin are attached to the Z lines, where the thick are attached to the M lines. And what happens is when they get activated, they slide over one another. And so that's this action that takes place. So that's what we're going to focus in on, is how does this contraction actually take place? And so you think about it, all these contract at once, and then they cause the muscle fiber to move, to move the skeleton in a different direction. And that's kind of how we think of movement. Okay, so again, the striated muscle, because you have this arrangement of my, uh, myofibrils, and typically you see these striations in the muscle like this for the thick and thin filaments, and that's why you call it striated muscle. Now, there are also a repeating section called sacromeres, and that's the basic contractile units. And like I said, the thin filaments are attached, or the actin is attached to the Z line, where the thick filaments are attached to the uh, M line. And so that's what's going to happen, and they're going to slide over one another here in just a second. So we call this a sliding filament mo model, and they pass each other longitudinally and overlap the thick and thin. And the contracting muscle shortens, but the filaments stay the same length. And so you can see, here's the relaxed muscle. Once it gets an action potential, you see that the thin filaments are now sliding over the thick, and then eventually they cross over one another and you get it contracted. So again, the, the, fi the, the, the fibers themselves or the fibrils or filaments do not get shorter, but what they do is they cross over one another and that's what causes the contraction. So you're not shortening the length at all, you're just sliding these over. And typically that's what happens. You grab on and you slide these things over. And we'll talk about how this all happens here in just a second. So the sliding relies on the interaction between the actin and myosin. And again, ATP hydrolysis provides the energy. So you need lots of ATP to contract your muscles. And the myosin head returns to a low energy state as it pulls the thin filament over the center. And that bond between the filaments is broken when a new ATP molecule binds to the myosin head. So we'll see that here in a second. So this is how the contraction takes place. So in the, in the resting state, the myosin head is attached to ATP. When it wants to contract, what will, do, what will happen is that it will release the ATP and that will allow for the head to come into this high energy configuration. So it flips up and that will allow it to bind to the myosin binding sites on the actin filament. It will eventually bind and create a cross bridge between the two filaments and then that will pull the muscle towards the thin filament or pull it so it slides over the thick. And so now the thin is getting pulled and so you pull that across and then eventually what happens is it releases the ADP and phosphate the myosin head goes back to the low in energy in uh, configuration, and then the new ATP can reload and release from the actin filament. And so then the cycle begins again, and then when it wants to contract again, the ATP is released, and then you can see how this head goes back in, grabs on, and pulls, and kind of continues this cycle. And so this is what we're going to look at and how these 
muscle fibrils actually contract uh, during the process of an action potential. So again, muscle contraction occurs repeated cycles of binding and releasing. The ATP is restored by the phosphate groups created from creatine phosphate. And then glycogen can also be used to break down and used to produce ATP through cell respiration. And we're going to talk about the different types of muscle fibers we have. We have the quick and the slow uh, twitch, and that all depends on what type of uh, cellular uh, reactions that it takes to produce ATP. Now again, what happens is in the resting state, the, the myosin is in the low energy configuration, and then the actin is over here. Then, then what happens is the nerve impulses cause the, again, the ATP to fall off and causing it to go to the high energy, which will grab onto the uh, actin filaments, causes the sliding to occur. So they slide over one another, the thick and thin filaments, and that will lead to contraction. And then the release is due to new ATP that now goes back onto the myosin head. And so that releases the muscle and causes it to relax over time. Okay, and this just shows you the animation. So again, it doesn't play well with my computer. So if you'd like to see how this all works and see how that myosin head goes from low energy to high energy and then back again, you can look at this. And it's kind of a cool little video, but like I said, I can't play it on my computer, but I wanted to include it in the PowerPoint so you could actually watch how it actually works in this configuration. Now, what sets this off? And so in order for the myosin head to actually grab onto the actin, you need to have myosin binding sites uh, exposed on the, on the actin filaments. Now, the two things that work against that is tropomyosin and the troponin complex. Troponin is where the myosin, the troponin complex actually blocks the uh, tropomyosin heads, or I'm sorry, the myosin binding sites on the actin heads here. And the tropomyosin also blocks those heads. So you can kind of see in the uh, blocked uh, situation, not only does the troponin complex block the uh, myosin heads, but also the tropomyosin. When calcium gets released, and I'll show you this here in a few minutes, so when an action potential from a nerve comes in, the, sacro, the, the, the sacroplastic reticulum releases calcium into the muscle, and that causes the tropomyosin and the troponin to actually move out of the way so that the myosin binding sites now get exposed. Now that these are exposed, now the myosin can grab on and contract the muscle and so then you get the sliding so two things have to happen not only do you have to have the myosin go into the high energy state for the releasing of atp but it also has to uh, be exposed and that has to be due to the calcium releasing so that the myosin binding sites are exposed on the actin heads so the tropomyosin and the troponin complexes have to bind to calcium so that it causes that configuration to bind on and lock in to uh, bind into this uh, fiber. Now, for the muscle to contract, like I said, the myosin binding sites must be uncovered. This occurs when calcium ions bind to the troponin complex and slide this open. And so again, the calcium comes in, it binds to the tropo, uh, troponin complex here, which causes the tropomyosin to move off the heads. And so it now exposes the binding, myosin binding sites. So now these holes are open. So now the myosin can actually bind on and grab onto the, uh, um, to the heads themselves. Typically, contraction occurs when the contraction uh, or uh, concentration of calcium is high, and then contraction stops when the calcium is low. And so calcium plays a huge part in the regulation of, again, contraction versus uh, relaxation of the muscle. So you need calcium in order for that to occur. Now, the stimulus uh, leading to the contraction of the muscle is the action potential from the motor neuron. And so essentially, the motor neuron comes in, you have the synaptic terminal, and this is going to send the signal to these wonderful sarcoplasmic reticulums, which release the calcium that causes the muscle fibers to contract. Again, exposing the, the fibrils so that the myosin can bind, and then now it can bind, it can then cause this to happen. Now, the neurotransmitter in this case is the acetylcholine. We talked about acetylcholine back in chapter 38 about how this all gets released and how it all works. And then the acetylcholine depolymerizes the muscle, causing to produce the action potential. And we saw this example of where if you took in sarin gas, what would happen is sarin would block 
uh, well, it actually blocks the inhibitor of, of acetylcholine. So what happens now, you get this continual release of acetylcholine, which will trigger a continual release of calcium, which would cause the muscle to contract constantly, and you go into what is called tetanus. And that's the same thing that happens when you get the tetanus toxin in you. The tetanus toxin causes this contraction and no release. And so you get this thing called lockjaw, which can lead to, again, a contraction of the diaphragm, which will allow you not to breathe. And you can die of respiratory failure because you can't contract or can't relax your muscles. So you can't allow for that breath to come out. It can come in, but it can't be released. And that's the problem when you get tetanus and the same thing that happens with the sarin gas. So it's nasty, nasty stuff. And that's due to over contraction of the muscle. Now with the action uh, potentials, uh, like we said, you have this release of acetylcholine. It causes it to bind to these, uh, again, pumps. These pumps allow for the Na to come in and then the excitation uh, passes and travels along these T tubules, which bind to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that causes this release of calcium, which then affects the troponin, which like I said, the troponin now binds, allows this for the exposure of the, uh, the actin filaments with the myosin binding sites. Now the myosin can bind on with the ADP and now you get contraction of the muscle. So it's a very complex system, but works very fast. And so even though there's all these steps involved, it, it takes a matter of milliseconds for the contraction of the muscle to actually work. And so it works very well. And again, it's dependent on the action potential. Basically the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which then causes the muscle to get an action potential, which leads to the release of the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing these binding sites to expose then the thick filament can grab on and then contract the muscle. And so that's typically what happens in these uh, situations. So the input stops, the muscle cell relaxes. Now what happens is the sarcoplasmic reticulum uptakes the calcium again. So when it gets, when the signal stops, it says, okay, stop the signal. Now the calcium gets reabsorbed by the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the pumps. And now that removes that. And again, now the myosin binding sites get blocked by the tropomyosin. And so again, it's a very complex system, but essentially it gets released. And then think of it like a vacuum cleaner sucking up the calcium again and re-bringing it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which now will prevent the myosin from binding because now the tropomyosin is covering the myosin binding sites on the active filaments and releasing the muscle there. Okay, so that's what happens in those situations. Now, there are several diseases that cause paralysis by an interfering with the skeletal muscles. Now, the first one is ALS, and this is the Lou Gehrig's disease, or known as ALS. And what happens is the motor neuron actually gets degraded, and so the nerve cell can no longer send the signals down the nerve. And so what happens is the muscle does not contract anymore. You get atrophy, and you lose that ability to signal to the muscles. And so this is something that happens over time. And eventually what happens in these patients is they lose motor function and eventually go into a coma and die because again, they don't have the motor function. So it's a, a gradual paralysis that takes place over time. And again, losing function over time due to the degradation of these nerve cells. And they're not really sure what triggers this degradation. Some of it, some, uh, some scientists believe it's a genetic others believe that there may be even a viral component to this and why this actually takes place and again we don't really know what triggers this uh, thing but there's probably research out there now that shows it so if you want to learn more about what triggers the atrophy in the uh, or not the atrophy but the de uh, de uh, degeneration in the motor neurons look up ALS and see uh, some of the newer research that's out there now another uh, another type of problem that can occur is this Mastavia gravis, which is an autoimmunity uh, disorder where the antibodies are produced that block the acetylcholine receptors. And so these uh, receptors get blocked by antibodies. Acetylcholine can be released, but what happens is you get reduced transmission, and so you get impaired muscle contraction. And so this is an autoimmunity that's different than ALS, where this is destroying the nerve cell. The nerve cell is fine, but what happens in this situation now, antibodies are being produced against the receptor that blocks the receptor, and now you don't get as much acetylcholine into the muscle, so you get reduced contraction in the muscle. So you get muscle weakness in this situation, where in this case you get paralysis due to the motor neuron uh, falling apart. And like I said, there's the opposite situation where again, like sarin gas or tetanus, 
where now you get this overstimulation and a constant release of acetylcholine, which causes the muscles to contract and not release. And so that's kind of the opposite. So you get paralysis in this case, whereas in like the idea of tetanus or um, or with sarin gas, you get contraction where it doesn't release, and that's called tetanus in the muscle. Okay, so can, a contraction of the whole muscle is graded, and the extent and the strength are under voluntary control. And the, really, the two things that control it are the number number of muscle fibers that contract and the rate at which they are stimulated. And so, again, with a single action potential, you get a single twitch in the muscle. And sometimes we experience this where we just get a twitch in the arm, and that could be just a single action potential that may be voluntary or involuntary that causes the muscle to contract. Typically, though, you get the summation of multiple action potentials where now you start to get more contraction. And, and then when you want to exert your muscles, you go into a period called tetanus. And I mentioned tetanus before, which is a contraction, overall contraction of the muscle. And this is, a, uh, again, a gradation or summation of all these action potentials uh, closely spaced. And so what happens is you fire a number of action potentials down the motor neurons, and that causes the muscle to contract. And it's a uh, tetanus where you get a constant contraction of the muscle. And that can be required to move things, again, to lift things or to move if you want to walk or do these different things. And that's what's going on in these situations. Now, the motor uh, unit, it consists of a single motor neuron and all the muscle fibers. So you can see a motor unit is, uh, is the motor neuron attached to the muscle fibers. And you, and you see in a muscle, you have multiple motor neurons, um, units that are connected to different uh, uh, muscle fibers. And so each motor unit can, uh, controls a different, different muscle fiber. But typically what happens is that the muscle, the, uh, the neuron that controls that, if it sends down an action potential, will cause a contraction of this fiber, this fiber, and this fiber. And then this motor unit will control this fiber and this fiber. And again, depending on how many fibers you have and how many motor neurons you have that are contracted to those will cause an overall contraction of the muscle. So you can see that it's really got a number of different motor neurons. It's not just one motor unit for muscle fiber or for every fiber in that muscle, but you have multiple units controlling multiple fibers in that muscle. And so the rule of thumb is, though, is that each fiber has its own motor unit that is controlled by one nerve itself. And so that's kind of the idea in this situation. Okay, and again, recruitment of multiple neurons results in stronger contractions. A twitch is from a single action potential, but a more rapidly delivered action potential produces a graded. And like I said, when we get this multiple uh, series of action potentials, we get what is called tetanus and contraction of that muscle. Okay, now tetanus is a state of smooth, sustained, sustained contraction of a rapid delivery of action potentials. And in this state, the muscle fibers can't relax in between the stimuli. And again, this is when we exert our muscles. And so eventually our muscles get really tired. And the reason for that is it's because it's been, con it's been constrained. And what happens is you use up the ATP, you're using up the calcium storage and all that in the sacral uh, plastic reticulum and that and so that's what causes muscle strain and muscle weakness over time because again you're using up those reserves that you have in those muscle fibers. Now like I said before we have actually two different types of skeletal muscle fibers and each are uh, for different functions. You have these slow twitch that are oxidative which uses aerobic respiration. You also have fast twitch oxidative uh, muscle fibers which are anaerobic. Now Again, it all relates to how um, fast they get uh, fatigued. Slow twitch are going to be slow or to get fatigued, where the fast twitch are going to be fast to fatigue. So that's kind of the difference between them. The other thing relies on how many mitochondria you have. And the slow twitch are going to have many along with the oxidative because they do aerobic respiration. And so they're going to need mitochondria to go through the whole process and do electron transport. These are also going to be the red muscles. So when we think of, uh, again, dark meat, this is going to be the red muscle. These are going to be the muscles that do the movements. And so dark meat is going to look dark because, of, again, a lot of mitochondria and a lot of these muscle fibers that are going to use aerobic respiration. Fast twitch glycolytic are just going to do glycolysis, and these are going to be white meat because they don't have a lot of mitochondria. And they're going to be for fast twitch, but they go, but ex uh, eventually they fatigue really quickly 
because they don't have a lot of ATP there. Because again, you're only doing glycolysis, which only produce it to ATP, as opposed to aerobic respiration, which produce 38. So these are going to be more sustained, longer contraction, where these are going to be slow, or these are going to be fast. They're going to be fast twitch, but you're not going to be able to sustain these very long because you're only making a small amount of ATP at the time. And so we have a combination of these different muscles and we'll talk muscle fibers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So again, we have oxidative and glycolytic fibers. Oxidative fibers rely mostly on aerobic respiration. And again, these have lots of mitochondria, lots of blood supply, and a lot of myoglobin. And we talked about myoglobin before in the blood. This is to provide oxygen to do uh, aerobic respiration. And so the protein binds oxygen more tightly than hemoglobin does. And this is a good source in the muscles. And we talked about this, especially with the diving animals. They have lots of myoglobin, lots of oxygen bound to their muscles so they can stay underwater for a long period of time because they have lots of myoglobin. And this just gives you an example. The slow twitch are going to allow you to run a long race. So you're going to be a marathoner. So if you have lots of long, uh, slow, or if you have a lot of slow twitch fibers, you're going to be a long distance runner. If you have lots of fast twitch, you're going to be a sprinter. And that's going to be the difference. And I'll talk about how we get these different muscles as we go along here in just a second. But that kind of gives you a different distance. And I like this because it just shows you how long these things can uh, rea rea react and how fast that they actually uh, allow you before they fatigue. And so again, we have a mixture of the two fiber types. Now, glycolytic are only using glycolysis, and that's the first step of oxidative or of uh, aerobic respiration. And again, that only produces two ATP as opposed to the 38 that you generate during aerobic respiration. So they have less myoglobin, they fatigue easily, and in poultry and fish, light meat is composed of glycolytic fibers where the dark meat is composed of oxidative fibers. And that makes sense because where do you find the dark meat? Wings and legs, okay? So that's going to need lots of ATP to move and do those things. Where do you find the white meat, the breast tissue, and other parts of the body where, again, they're not going to need a lot of a lot of energy to move those muscles. And so typically we just build those up to get nice and thick so that you have a nice big turkey and turkey breast or chicken breast uh, that you're going to eat, whereas the, the wings and the legs are going to be more flavorful. They're going to be a little more greasy in that due to the mitochondria and the aerobic respiration that they do and the types of fibers that are there. And so that's what you see in those situations. Now, again, fast and slow twitch fibers are differentiated by the speed of contraction. Slow twitch contract more slowly, but stay in longer contractions. And again, fast twitch contract more rapidly, but stay in shorter contractions. And again, the fast, these tend to be oxidative, all the slow twitch. Fast twitch show you uh, are, are either glycolytic or oxidative. Now, with the slow twitch, you can see they're smaller, darker due to the myoglobin, and they're fatigue resistant. So those are going to be the darker muscle. And then you have the white meat, which is going to be, again, fast twitch fibers, which typically don't have as many mitochondria. They're lighter in color due to that. And then, again, they're going to be fast, but, again, they don't sustain very long. And so that's the difference between slow and fast. Slow, long sustained contractions, uh, fast very quick but short sustaining uh, muscle in that case. Now in human skeletal muscles we contain both and it varies in ratios. Typically this is genetics and this is one of the things that you actually find out in um, in the 23andMe you actually get and I, I did this that's why how I know is one of the things they tell you is how many muscle types do you have or the types of muscles that you have. Do you have more of the slow twitch or do you have more of the fast twitch? And that would tell you what type of runner you would be. So if you like to do running as uh, as a activity to you know maintain a certain weight or exercise, if you want to run marathons, you need a lot of long, uh, long slow twitch muscles. Whereas if you want to run short uh, races, you're going to be better off with the fast twitch muscles. And so you can find out genetically what you are. And in my case, I have more fast twitch muscles, so I'm more adept at running sprints or middle distance running. Whereas if I started building up and maybe if I ran much longer and I ran every day, you can actually switch some of your fast twitch over to now more oxidative. So they become more endurance uh, type. And so you can switch your fast twitch from glycolytic to a more endurance type and so become more oxidative. Now that doesn't mean you're now going to be able to run 100, uh, 100 mile marathons or anything like that. 
those those are really for those that are genetically inclined that have a lot more slow twitch muscles and so again they're going to be more likely to be able to easily run a marathon and do much better but like i said you can train yourself to switch your fast switch over to more of an oxidative type and again kind of responding to using oxygen getting more myoglobin and doing those different types of things so just wanted to point that out and just show you but typically long distance runners are going to have more oxidative Fast sprinters are going to have more of like a lytic, and so that's the, the difference between those different types of muscles there. Now, in some vertebrates, muscles twitch at rates much faster than humans, and for example, this frog here can actually twitch and relax its muscles involved in mating calls more than 200 times a second, so it produces these really uh, inspired calls and mating signals and that stuff, and so again, that's all due to how fast or slow they twitch their muscles and these guys can twitch them very fast producing these different sounds. Now in addition to skeletal muscle, vertebrates have cardiac muscle and smooth muscle that will do uh, also work and typically these muscles are controlled and voluntarily controlled by the brain stem. And cardiac muscle is found only in the heart and consists of striated cells that are electrically connected to the intercalculated disc and so these are the discs, you have the Z and the M's in this case and again they slide but they're under control of involuntary control. And these guys can actually generate action potentials without neural input, so they can generate their own uh, and can cause their own contraction, and they can beat on their own type of thing. And so that's one of the things that cardiomuscles do. And again, I have this video for you guys to watch so you can see a cardiomyocyte actually uh, beating, and so you can kind of see how this muscle actually contracts on its own. So again, I recommend watching that good video to see in this case. Now, smooth muscles lack any striations, and they're found in the walls of hollow organs such as blood vessels. And again, contractions are relatively slow and may be initiated from, without inputs and neurons. In most cases, smooth muscle contractions are stimulated by neurons of the autonomic nervous system and, again, involuntary control. And so the signal comes from the brainstem to contract. And we talked about this with peristalsis, with the esophagus and squeezing of the muscles. We also see this with the blood vessels and then the squeezing of the arteries and veins to get blood either to or away from the heart, depending on the vessel that you're talking about in those cases. Now, invertebrate muscles have very similar um, skeletal muscles to uh, the vertebrates. And so, again, if we look at a comparison, this is a vertebrate muscle shown here. Here's invertebrate, and you can see they have the same type of thing. They have the tropomyosin fibers, the actin um, fibers that surround it. They're spaced a little bit differently, but not much in these situations. And you can see the difference in the size, but they're very similar to the different ones. So this is a vertebrate muscle. This is an invertebrate. And you can see that they have the same type of features to them, and they respond very similar with calcium. Uh, removing the tropomyosin, so now you have the myosin grabbing on. Some unique adaptions that have evolved in some of these groups is that muscles holding the clamshell close uh, contain this thing called paramycin, which is a protein that allows for long-term contraction and low energy requirements. So they can keep their shell closed for a long period of time without opening it, and again, not allowing them to use a lot of energy, not a lot of ATP, and that allows it to keep it closed and contracted for a long period of time. So I'm sure there's probably some geneticists out there looking at paramycin and seeing how can we apply that to humans in having long contractions without using a lot of energy. And again, that might be a way to, uh, again, keep people running for a long period of time without using a lot of energy in that in, in those situations. Now, the next part where we're going to talk about is how the skeletal system plays along with this. And again, the skeleton provides a rigid structure in which muscles attach to antagonistic pairs. So like I said, each of our muscle groups has an antagonistic pair. One will contract, the other one relax. And so this is very similar to what we see with an external skeleton as the muscles are attached to the external skeleton on the outside and essentially works the same way. You have one muscle that will contract while the other one relaxes at the same time. Like in our bicep, our tricep relaxes when we flex our bicep. The opposite is true when we relax our bicep, now the, the tricep contracts. And so you have the antagonistic pair of doing both in these situations. And what this allows us to do is do contraction and relaxation and allows us for movement. And so again, it's just a series of contraction and extensions of these muscles that allow us to move and do what we wanna do with our bodies. And again, skeletons also supply, uh, 
also function in support and protection of the body as well. And so like the rib cages protect our, our organs, vital organs like our lungs and our heart, as well as our skull protecting our brain and making sure that that's nice and cozy inside our cranial, uh, cranial compartment in there, okay? Now, like I mentioned before, there are three types of skeletons. There's the hydroskeleton, uh, hydrostatic skeleton, which lack hard parts, and they use the fluid from the body cavities to help move. The endoskeleton, or exoskeletons, which are on the outside that provide protection, and typically uh, the soft tissue is attached to that from the outside. And then you have the endoskeleton, like us, and really all vertebrates that have an endoskeleton, either of cartilage or bone, which allow for the muscles attached there. And so you can kind of see the difference between the three. The endoskeleton has an inner frame, has bones or cartilage inside of vertebrates. Exoskeleton is the outer frame, where again, they typically have a hard skin um, uh, with substances like calcium carbonate or chitin that keep them nice and solid. And then the hydroskeleton or hydrostatic skeleton is due to fluid pressure in the space of the of the pair or of the of the space that allows them to contract using that fluid to do uh, muscular contractions on the inside. And we'll look at each one of these in in detail here how this all works. Now with the hydrostatic skeleton, this is where fluid under the pressure of a closed body compartment allows the muscles to contract and extend. And so, and essentially this works kind of like how our esophagus does with peristalsis. And so again, they use these rhythmic contractions using the fluid that allows them to extend and contract the muscle and allows it to move through the soil. And so this is the main type of skeleton that most cnidarians, flatworms, nematodes, and annelids use to move through either water or soil in these situations. And again, under the hydrostatic skeleton, they use peristalsis, a type of movement on land produced by rhythmic contractions and muscle contractions. And again, this is the same system that we use to squeeze our esophagus and our intestines to get food through our, our tissues. And so this is how worms use basically to move things through and get things through and do these different things. And that's how they move through either the soil or water using their rhythmic contractions and the fluid inside their body cavities. Now, an exoskeleton is a hard skeleton on the outside. And again, they use their muscles that are attached to the exoskeleton on the outside that we see. And typically we find the exoskeletons in mollusks and arthropods. These arthropods have a jointed exoskeleton called a cuticle, which can be both strong and flexible. And so one of the things that they do have to do is shed when they do grow, because again, it only allows them to expand for so far. And then in order to get it to a bigger animal, they have to molt and shed. And what happens is basically they break out of their old exoskeleton. This is soft while, uh, again, this is soft for a couple hours until it hardens back up. And once it's exposed to air, it causes the hardening to occur. And then it will get hard again uh, over time to protect the animal. Now, about 30 to 50% of the arthropods cuticle consists of the polysaccharide called chitin. And so that's the hard uh, again, the polysaccharide that causes the hardening of the plates. And again, like I mentioned, the arthropod must shed and regrow its exoskeleton when it grows. And so it will go through this process of molting. The molting will cause it to shed and cause the um, skeletal, like I said, the new exoskeleton to be up here after it sheds that old one. Now, in vertebrates, we have what is called an endoskeleton, and this can be either hard internal skeleton of buried, buried in soft tissue. Most cases of vertebrates, they use bone, but again, with the uh, cartilage fish, like the sharks and rays and snakes and any of the other uh, early vertebrates, all use cartilage to use that. And we even have some examples of cartilage that's left that allow us to, again, use as a endoskeleton-like feature, and it gives us a little more flexibility, like in our ears and our nose. And that, but primarily most of the endoskeleton in uh, in higher vertebrates is going to be made of bone. Now, the mammalian skeleton has more than 200 bones, but it, uh, typically most mammals have the same or pretty close to the same amount. Again, in the same types of functions throughout, and that's one of the things that we use for uh, uh, evolution is looking at homology and homologous structures. And in mammals, they have a very similar bone structure in both the limbs and in the body. And so that's one of the things that we use in, in there. Now, again, some bones are fused together while others are connected 
uh, at joints by ligaments that allow for freedom of movement. And so again, remember tendons connect the muscle to the bone where the ligaments connect bone to bone. And that's the difference between those two. Now looking at some different types, and again, this is just a short, uh, short uh, really quick look at the joints. One of them is the ball and socket. And so again, the ball fits into the socket of the shoulder joint. We see this also in the femur with the ball and socket going into the pelvis. Other types of joints like the hinge joint, the humerus going into the ulna and radius. And so you can see how that kind of fits in and it allows for, again, the flexing of the arm. And then we also have the pivot joint, which is uh, down here. Uh, which allows us to rotate. And so you have both a pivot and a hinge in the same spot where it allows it to rotate and twist. And so you can twist your arm and then rotate up. If you look at your dog and cat, they can't do the twisting. They lack that because again, the fusing of the, of the joint there. And so they can't twist their arm, but they can just flex it, moving it back and forth. And so they just have a hinge joint, not a pivot like we do. And again, we can also look at the pivot of a wrist because a wrist can pivot again with our with our arm pivoting as well. Okay, and so that's some examples of some joints. Now the size and scale of skeletons, again, the animal's body structure must support its size. And so the weight of the body increases with the cube, so the, the three, so to the cube level of dimensions. And so while the length of that body increases with the square of its dimensions, and so this, or I'm sorry, the strength, I didn't think I said length. So weight goes by the cube of the dimensions, strength is by the square. And so again, typically, the weight is going to be much more than the strength of the animal based on the weight of the endoskeleton that you have. And again, skeletons of small and large animals have different proportions based on, again, the type of skeleton, endoskeleton they have, and then also how many bones they have versus, again, the weight that they are and how large they are. So small animals are going to have fewer bones because, again, they don't need as much to support the weight where larger animals are going to need more bones to be able to support the weight and be able to handle the different um, structures that they have in those in those animals. Now in mammals and birds, the position of the legs are relative to the body and very important to determine how much weight the legs can bear. And again, the muscles and tendons bear most of the load on the large animals. And so you see this especially in athletes that push themselves a little too hard. And that's why you see a lot of the injuries that happen. So you see tears in the tendons, you see tears in the ligaments. And that's just due to the additional strain that an athlete is putting on their body. Now, normal humans are able to walk and run and do all those different things just fine. It's typically when we push ourselves to uh, extreme levels that these things break. They're not in, indestructible, and so those things do happen, and it does happen. But if you look, the, the way that the pelvis is arranged in the human as well as in the bird allows for the legs to bail bear most of the weight. And again, the skeletal system, that's why the femur is the biggest bone in your body. It's because it's supporting a lot of weight. It's supporting all the upper body in this case. Whereas you look at our femur compared to a bird, their femur is not nearly as big as our femurs. And so again, because we are upright in that, and again, a lot of their bones have air pockets that allow them to be light and allow them to fly. And so again, Due to the weight of a human, we have to have these very large bones in our legs to make sure we can support our weight in that. And so that's one of the key features. And so, again, we can talk about weight in that stuff in class, and especially when you get overweight in that stuff, how much strain you're actually putting on the bones and joints and that uh, because of that. And so a lot of times you see people that are overweight have serious problems with the different joints, especially the knee joints and the ankle joints because of the amount of weight that they're holding onto their body. Okay, now again, we're the last part we're going to talk about is some of the different locomotion. And this is the ability of animals to move from place to place. And again, energy is expended to overcome the friction and gravity. And so different types of locomotion that occur can be galloping. A cheetah is the fastest land animal. And again, the ba based on how they run. And then again, a kangaroo does hopping in this case, but the, the ability to move in these situations allow them to move very fast. So you can see how fast these animals are. Humans, the, about the average is about 21 miles an hour. That's about the extreme, maybe a little bit faster, 22 in those cases. And so, but on average is the fastest that a human can run is about 20 miles an hour, whereas opposed to other animals, they can run a much, much faster due to the strides that they have and that the bigger the stride, the faster they actually move. Now, walking, running, and hopping all requires the animal to support itself and move against gravity. 
Air provides little resistance, strong muscles, and skeletal support are more important than a streamlined shape in these situations because, again, there's little resistance in the air. Crawling insects have adaptations to overcome the friction between their bodies and the ground, so allow, allows them to move pretty fast because of, again, how close they are to the ground. And we're always fighting against gravity, and so, again, strong muscles and bones allow us, us to move faster, and so building up those muscles are going to allow us to have more endurance as well as allow us to move faster in these situations. Again, other diverse uh, adaptations of locomotion on land have evolved in vertebrates, including kangaroos that have large powerful muscles in their hind legs that allow them for hopping. And so again, they develop the hopping nature and structure. And so these very large hind legs allow them to hop very fast and use those muscles to get, a, get around very quickly in those situations. Now in water, they function, the friction is a bigger problem, and so they have to have more torpedo-like bodies. And so we see this with swimmers, where they're trying to streamline down and become as, uh, and they wear uh, suits like shark skin to get as streamlined as possible. And so that's where you see the difference. And so humans weren't really built to swim, so they have to kind of manufacture themselves to get it in as more torpedo shape in these uh, situations. Now fish, again, more of a torpedo shape using their bodies to kind of move back and forth in a wave-like pattern to kind of use their fins. Other animals will use jet propulsion, so I like this little video, I'm glad this actually worked, that you can see how clams actually move. They use their muscles to squirt water and they use jet propulsion to kind of move in this way. And then typically with the fish, they undulate their body and tail from side to side or up and down to kind of move through their water. And so in vertebrates that are in the water, they can use their legs as or, and so we use the paddling and that and using our arms and legs to actually move. And I really think that's kind of cool, showing you how a clam moves around or uh, yeah, a clam or a bivalve moves in the water using their siphons to push the water through and allow them to move in the water. Now the last type of movement is flying. And again, this requires wings to develop enough lift to overcome the downward force of gravity. The wings are shaped to act as airfoils and fusiform body shape reduces drag. Many flying animals had adaptation to reduce body mass. And like I said, in birds, they have air spaces in their bones. And so again, allows them to do that. They have a urinary bladder, they lack a urinary bladder to have weight uh, and teeth. So again, less weight. So how do you get to fly? You got to get rid of the weight. And so that's the big thing. And so when they get rid of weight, allows them to fly and allows them to get off the ground. And so if humans ever wanted to try and fly themselves, they'd have to lose a lot of weight in order to do that and evolve new bones because our bones are really heavy. There's no way that we get off the ground without some type of mechanical force. And obviously the development of planes and that stuff, but if we wanted to have individual jet packs and something, obviously we need enough propulsion to get ourselves off the ground to battle gravity, which holds us down onto the ground. And so that's the big issue in those situations. So we made it to the end of this lecture. Hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully you learned how a muscle contracts. So it's the sliding of those filaments across one another. And so we talked about the physical interactions of the protein filaments that allow for muscle for, uh, function. And again, it's the sliding of the actin and myosin. The myosin grabs on. And again, we need calcium to uh, release the myosin binding sites so they can grab on and pull these fibers across one another. And so the fibrils get pulled across. So you get the actin and myosin being uh, slid across. That allows for the contraction of the muscle. Again, ATP allows for the myosin to grab onto the thin filament. The, they slide and contract the muscle fiber. And in order for this to happen, you have to have calcium to trigger the muscle contraction due to the action potentials of the nerve. And so again, the action potential, the release of acetylcholine, allows for the uh, that action potential to hit the muscle fiber that triggers the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium which allows for the topomyosin to be uh, moved over and so allows for the myosin to grab on and then allows for the sliding to happen and again for that myosin to move you need ATP we talked about the different types of uh, fibers themselves you have slow versus fast switch Slow muscle fibers are going to be more long sustaining. Those are going to be the red muscle cells. Lots of mitochondria, oxidative phosphorylation, and uh, aerobic respiration. Whereas the fast twitch are going to be glycolytic, meaning they do glycolysis. Not a lot of ATP. They're going to fatigue really quickly in that. And we can look at people's genetics to see what type of muscle fibers they actually have. The last thing we talked about were the skeletal systems. We looked at how the skeletal systems use the muscles to for contraction for that. 
Typically, we have antagonistic pairs of muscles that will pull against the skeleton to allow it to move in one direction or the other for locomotion. We talked about the different types of skeletal systems, the endo, endoskeletal, like what we have, either bone or cartilage, the exoskeletal systems, which are the hardened shells on the outside of the body, typically found in insects and crustaceans and mollusks, and then the hydrostatic skeletons, which are found in worms and jellies and that stuff that use fluid to do peristalsis to have it move either in squeezing of the muscles to get that either to move forward or backwards in water or uh, in the soil. Then we looked at the different types of locomotion, how they use it. On land, it's much easier because we have less resistance. So typically it's about the strength of the muscle and how fast an animal is going to move and the, and the length and, and that and the endurance. Versus in water, it's going to be more streamlined and again, using their muscles in one direction or the other to move around. And we saw some examples of how that works. And then flight, for animals to flight, they have to be lightweight. So again, air spaces and bones, loss of heavy things that weigh them down. And so less bones allows them to fly and get off the ground because you're fighting against gravity and looking at those different things. So with that, we've come to the end. If you have any questions about the muscles and how they contract, or how the skeletal system works, please let me know. Send me an email. We'll talk about it in class during lab and look at how these things all work. We'll play around with some uh, locomotion and that and that in the lab itself. But with that, we've come to the end. If you do have any questions, send it, send it my way. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.